Howdy and hello folks, my name is Christian Sasser, but you can call me MH4 and say what you want about Fortnite, but that game has excellent art direction, especially in later seasons, and that art direction carries over into the character design. This video aims to closely inspect how the philosophy of Fortnite Battle Royale's character design has evolved over the years, starting in Chapter 1, Season 1, and ending in Chapter 4, Season 2, the most recently concluded season at the time of this video's recording. There are very clear and trackable trends that make themselves readily apparent whenever you closely inspect them, so allow me to do the close inspection for you. Also, for the sake of transparency, this video going forward will be mostly unscripted and largely guided by bullet points, so if I don't go into enough detail about something, I apologize. I should also mention this video is specifically about outfits. There will be no harvesting tools, no gliders, no wraps, etc. Additionally, I won't be going into complete detail about every single season. I'm going to be splitting the design trends I find into overall arcs that are further segmented into eras, and it'll make a lot more sense once I actually start discussing it. Finally, no unreleased content will be considered, only outfits that officially launched. Be sure to let me know what I missed in the comments because I know for a fact I probably did miss something. All right, let's begin. The very first arc in Fortnite's design history is what I like to call the Angular arc, which spanned all of chapter one. This is where Fortnite had, in my opinion, more of a very distinct design philosophy. All of the characters felt a lot more cartoonish and had, as the name suggests, a lot more angular proportions. Features like characters' eye shapes, their hairline, their noses, all of it felt like it had a more jagged edge to it that eventually gets sanded down over time. However, this jagged edge in the design philosophy is the defining trait of chapter one, in my opinion. It's one of them. However, as we'll get into, a lot of the design philosophies present were a little bit too pervasive throughout the seasons, so I think it leads to a lot of skins being a little bland and uninspired. Speaking of bland and uninspired, we begin our discussion with the first ever era of Fortnite design philosophy, the Recolored Era, spanning from Chapter 1 Season 1 to Chapter 1 Season 3. Pretty much every single outfit in this era is a recolor of another, either that or a retexturing of another outfit. In this era, most of the major differences between outfits amount to things like helmets or different pieces of gear on the body. It's not very major changes that require a lot of new modeling work to be done. It's a lot of mostly just like surface texture changes. The most dramatically altered outfits in season one are Crackshot and Red Knight, who both require a little bit more modeling work to be done on the outfit, but ultimately are just, again, recolors with extra accessories. As the era progresses into season two, we get a bit more creativity with these recolors and retextures and uh, with these extra accessories being added. For example, we get uh, iconic outfits Love Ranger and especially iconic Cuddle Team Leader. As the art name suggests, there is a big focus on angularity, but there is also a big focus on uniformity. If you take a close look at the character designs, all male outfits include two shin guards and the same number of belts and all female outfits include shin guards on the left leg and a belt on the right. There is some mild asymmetry to keep things interesting visually, but again, that asymmetry is uh, congruent across the board. It all follows a template, right? And each template is based off of one of the default outfits. As we get into Chapter 1 Season 3, we see more experimentation with outfits like Leviathan and Wukong. Wukong is, to my knowledge, a completely new character model, complete with new facial features and very ornate looking armor. And Leviathan is the very first, I think the very first, uh, non-human character to be added to Fortnite, which was a huge, like, drastic step. But even with that new drastic step, there are still a lot of the core design philosophies present. For example, if you take a look at Leviathan's back, he still has that weird looking, like, strap backpack thing that's meant to put back blings on so they look more realistic. That's there and that's present. There's, If you take a, a close examination of the more unique skins from this era, they all still 
feel like they follow the same core design philosophies. Our second era of Fortnite design philosophy is what I like to call the expansion era, and this spans the rest of chapter one, going from season four to season X or season 10. Starting in season four, we see a good handful of original design concepts, such as uh, the Visitor, Valor, and Squad Leader. Don't get me wrong, it's still firmly rooted in that angularity of the first few seasons, but slowly but surely, we're seeing the same cast of default characters being traded out for a lot more uniqueness and variety. As usual, there are more recolors, but they're starting to get a little bit more creative. One of my personal favorites is Fireworks Team Leader. Moving into season five, I think the two most standout outfits from this season are Ragnarok and the iconic Drift. Ragnarok stands out to me specifically for the ornateness of his armor and for the idea of like armor progressing, but the progression is more of a game design thing. I'm talking about the character design. The character design is very elaborate and it's showing that they're willing to become more and more elaborate in creating these new character models. And the same goes for Drift, who very notably, even though he still looks like an early Fortnite character, thanks to his, you know, design of his, the, the angles, right? It's, it's all in the angles. <laughs> even though he still looks like an early Fortnite character, he doesn't have uh, the shin guards, he doesn't have the belts. I don't think he's wearing any belts at all. And except for this like gold portion of his tank top, Drift is completely symmetrical. Drift, in my opinion, can represent this sort of breaking away from their traditional design philosophies. Again, the recolors are becoming more creative. They're moving away from being just recolors and more of like remixes or repackagings. Take outfits like Peekaboo and Night Night, for example. They're Jonesy and Ramirez, but they're clowns. Or take Far Out Man and Dreamflower, for example. They're Jonesy and Ramirez, but they're hippies. And speaking of those remixes, one thing that I think is interesting to point out moving into season six is that we start seeing remixes of remixes. Uh, take Dark Bomber, for example, who is a remix of Bright Bomber, who is a recoloring of Ramirez. <laughs> Dark Bomber takes the new idea that uh, Bright Bomber uh, established and turns it into the like the dark aesthetic that Fortnite likes to push with some of their outfits. Or take Spooky Team Leader, for example, which is also one of the default female outfits dressed like a uh, bear mascot. But when we take it from Cuddle Team Leader to Spooky Team Leader, it's that same bear mascot, but it's now a zombie. And as this chapter of Fortnite and this arc of Fortnite design concludes, we really see that original character models start to outweigh the remixes and the recolors. And I think there's four distinct categories that these new character models generally tend to fall into. First, we have mascot characters, that's outfits like Lil Whip and Twisty. Next is inanimate objects, that's outfits like Peely or Airhead. Next is Furries, and that's characters like Dire or Fenix. And lastly, we have Monsters, which are more supernatural characters like Zorgatron or Slumber. One very important thing to mention about this era of design is when we first see a collaboration outfit with the Marshmallow skin. Very early on, a lot of collab skins with Fortnite weren't the actual character. It was somebody from Fortnite cosplaying as that character. Take, for example, the Star-Lord outfit or the Black Widow outfit. Or when it was the actual character, such as Marshmallow, it took Fortnite's pre-existing design philosophies and applied it to that character. We can see very clearly the sort of angularity and the, like, weaponry of Fortnite applied to Marshmallow. Season 9's John Wick and Stranger Things collaborations do show that they're willing to model specific characters based off of the original IP, especially with the Demogorgon, but that sort of angularity is still present and that philosophy of design is still present in the crossover. I guarantee you if the Demogorgon skin were to release today, it would look so much different than it did when it released back in season nine. The concept of Fortnite characters dressing up as the crossover characters that started with Star-Lord and Black Widow ends with the Batman comic book outfit and the Dark Knight movie outfit. And with that, we enter the next arc of Fortnite's character design, the breakout arc. Epic Games took Fortnite's first big reset as an excuse, arguably, <laughs> to move away from angularity and their more traditional design philosophy and move towards realism, which is a trend that continues exponentially from here on out. 
And arguably one of the most impactful decisions of this arc is the introduction of new default characters. Now in season one, the design philosophy has changed dramatically right away and it's incredibly noticeable. One thing that's instantly recognizable is that the design of crossover characters more closely resemble their IP to where the design philosophy of Fortnite is superseded by the original design philosophy of the crossover. For example, the crossovers in season one include a Harley Quinn outfit, some Star Wars outfits from the sequel trilogy, as well as Ninja from Fortnite. <laughs> and all three of them closely resemble their live action human counterparts. And I know I said at the top of this arc that they're leaning more into realism, but another thing they're leaning more into now is experimentation. First, let's discuss realism and by going over the new defaults. They have smaller, more realistically proportioned eyes, and they have more modern haircuts that are less combat focused than the originals and more stylish. A big thing that Fortnite slowly progresses its way into is style. Fortnite eventually, as we'll get to, becomes very obsessed with fashion. And we can see the first rumblings of that with the new, more sleek, more modern haircuts of the new defaults. Of course, these new principles don't just apply to the new defaults. Some notable outfits include Serana, Turk, Hush, and the Autumn Queen. Now let's look into something a bit more interesting in my opinion, the experimentation. This new season gave us skins like Candyman, who is quite literally a guy made out of Valentine's candy. Kane, who always has his jaw open, is made of candy cane and has unusually skinny proportions for a Fortnite skin. That's another one of the underrated heroes of new Fortnite design philosophy is the willingness to change proportions. We see them experimenting with proportions starting as early as chapter one, season one. Sorry, chapter two, season one. We see Big Mouth who has no eyes and just a giant gaping maw of a mouth with a freaking long tongue. And while there are still recolors, notably the relationship between an outfit and its remix or recolor is explored a lot in this season's battle pass, there are a good few very unique and thought out remixes in this season. Take for example Peely Bone, who shows a new willingness to embrace explicit horror themes because Peely Bone is quite literally a half undead Peely with his skeleton and other body parts exposed. And Bundles is elevated from being a simple Cuddle Team Leader recolor by her anime-inspired expression lines. This leads us into Chapter 2 Season 2, which mostly follows the same sort of philosophy as Season 1 did, but we see a few more standout models like Brutus and Meowsles experimenting with more broad-shouldered and larger proportions on characters. We also see the idea of cell shading first being entertained with T and Tina's alternative style. In my opinion, there are three standout models of this season. Uh, the first one is Oro, who experiments with proportions in a unique way by having his arms just be skeleton arms, and Travis Scott, of all things, who I think personally sets a brand new standard for realism in Fortnite. However, the most unique skin, I think, of this season has to be Meowsles, hands down. Meowsles is the culmination of all the design philosophy breakages up to this point. He is an anthropomorphic animal rather than being human. He has drawn on eyes and a drawn on mouth rather than having a more traditional eyes and mouth. And he has burly proportions rather than the normalized standardized ones of chapter one. Overall, he's a testament to how much Fortnite's art team has changed their minds on what can and cannot be a Fortnite skin. Season three sees the trends of the previous season also continue, but we have one standout moment. Kit. Kit once again challenges what it means to be a Fortnite skin. He's fittingly Meowsel's son, and he once again spits in the face of uniformity that the angular arc held so dearly. First of all, he's neither human nor anthropomorphic animal. He's a normal cat riding a motor-powered unicycle that powers a mech suit. And he has an emote that only he can use 
that shows off just how truly wacky this concept is for a Fortnite skin. He also includes drawn on eyes and a drawn on mouth. And I genuinely can't tell if he's supposed to have like the normal proportions or the more burly proportions, just because of how wacky and crazy his design is compared to other more normal Fortnite designs. Kit takes what Meowsles represented, the art team's willingness to push both themselves and the limits of what can be a Fortnite outfit, and he just runs with it. He blows what Meowsles did out of the water. And there are a few more standout outfits from this season. Outfits like Fade and Tart Tycoon show a willingness to remix ideas of what outfits represent rather than the outfits themselves. The specific example I want to bring up is Fade, who, much like Drift, is a normal street kind of guy who progresses into this like big boss kind of character inspired by Japanese culture wearing an electrified mask and a cloak. That idea is remixed from Drift into Fade. The double agent bundle shows that recolors are still alive and well, but they're becoming a little bit more inventive now, and they're becoming more thematic. Uh, specifically, the double agent bundle is all gold and black, or gold and white, to represent the, uh, the battle between Ghost and Shadow, as well as the golden Midas touch that was present in Chapter 2, Season 2. And I just think Trench Trawler kind of looks funny. Season 4, crossover accuracy is taken to a whole new level because the 5 billion Marvel characters they introduced here all look exactly like they were ripped out of the pages of Marvel Comics. The two DC characters take a few more creative liberties. I particularly like Joker's hat and they feel more unique as a result. And while with some specific outfits, the angularity can still be felt in the design philosophy, I think the final nail in the angular coffin has to be the Silver Surfer's design because that man is all curves. We also get more experimentation with cell shading to close out this era of Fortnite design. Uh, notably, both of the examples included are trying to emulate comic book shading, with both of those examples being the Courageous Era set and the Daredevil crossover outfit. And again, notably, Daredevil is the first crossover character to include cell shading. Next, we move into what I like to call the new normal era of Fortnite, which spans from Chapter 2, Season 5 to Chapter 2, Season 7. I call this era the new normal because they're starting to become very comfortable with the new groundwork that they've laid out with the beginning of the breakout arc. For one thing, the doors are blown completely off the hinges for angles, like RIP angles because these characters are smooth. And again, crossover accuracy trumps everything else. Three very accurate looking outfits from this season, in my opinion, are the Mandalorian, Kratos, and Master Chief. And I have to mention the Xenomorph and Snake Eyes because they also look incredibly accurate, just phenomenally like the source material. We also get our first cell shaded skin in the Battle Pass in the form of Lexa. Very notably, she has a different kind of cell shading than the previous few skins. She's not trying to replicate a comic book style, she's trying to look more like an anime style. Moving into season six, the diversity of art styles is seriously starting to alter. Toon Meowsles is trying to be the sort of like faux rubber hose effect, and he once again brings in a new style of cell shading to Fortnite. The Cyber Infiltration Pack shows a doubling down on both anime influence in Fortnite character design, as well as cell shading in Fortnite character design. And arguably my favorite outfit of this season, Batman Zero. Batman Zero is crossover accuracy married to some of the design principles of the Angular arc. He has accuracy in the sense that he's no longer Jonesy's character model dressed up as Batman, but he has a new specific character design that resembles the comics more clearly. But he also includes some of that classic design philosophy in the asymmetry of his details. We see the too many belts, we see some Fortnite specific weaponry equipped on those belts and he's got the little around the back backpack strap thingy. Season seven mostly continues the trajectory of season six, but the two most standout outfits in my mind are Gilded Guy and Mecha Morty. First of all, they're both crossover characters, so pop culture is obviously now very, very important to where Fortnite takes its design, but they're also cell shaded outfits and they're cell shaded in unique ways that are accurate to the source material. They're as accurate to the source material as they possibly could be 
They hardly even need to be altered from their original designs to fit into Fortnite other than just being made from 2D to 3D. Mechamorty takes what Kit introduced to Fortnite and applies it to both collabs and to cell shading. That being the fundamental challenging of what it means to be a Fortnite outfit because he is a guy in a robot mecha chair with enormous bulging eyes and dangling little legs. And Gilded Guy represents the crossover accuracy of this new philosophy by having his expressions be only in his eyes because Gilded Guy's character design, whenever he has his gold helmet on, his mouth isn't showing, so he has to emote with his eyes. And I think the Fortnite team pulled that off very well. And if you take a look at Guild Guy's hands, they look like this. He only has his index finger and his thumb separate from the rest of his hand, and the other three fingers are this sort of like stylized lump thing. And that carries over into his Fortnite incarnation. And this leads us into our third and currently final arc of Fortnite character design, the Anything Goes arc. At this point, it kind of doesn't seem like Epic Games really cares that much what goes on with Fortnite's character design, as long as it vaguely looks like it could be a Fortnite skin, it is a Fortnite skin. However, I think there is originality and diversity at the expense of recognizability and identity. I personally think that the Breakout arc has a much better balance between what happens in the Anything Goes arc with experimentation and realism, as well as the fundamentals that are presented in the original Angular arc. However, we're not here for my opinion, we're here for the analysis, so let's move into our first era, the Kitchen Sink era, which is Chapter 2 Season 8 through Chapter 3 Season 1. Chapter 2 Season 8 just kind of does whatever it wants. There's no real rhyme or reason to any of the outfits chosen. There's no cohesive thematic idea, it's just throwing anything at the wall and seeing what sticks. Obviously, there is some semblance of an art style still here, but it's truly in this season where we see Fortnite go from experimentation truly into absurdism. And that fashion influence that I foreshadowed truly starts here with the most explicit influence that you can get from high fashion, a collaboration with Balenciaga. I'm not going to mention all of them, but just know that collaborations with lifestyle brands do become very prevalent from here on out. And we get the first actual anime crossover in this season with the crossover with Naruto. Fortnite has established anime as a solid influence for its design, but it's here that we first see Fortnite actually incorporate an anime property into its design. And there are some noticeable differences in the way the cell shading is handled from the first experiments with Lexa all the way into the actual inclusion of anime with Naruto. You can tell they've kind of refined their process for anime themed cell shading. One notable outfit of this era is the Cause Skeleton. He has the black cell outline over the normal Fortnite stylization, and I believe this is the first instance that we've seen of cell shading being combined with the normal shading style. And again, this is Fortnite using a crossover as a means of experimenting with its art style. And another notable skin of this season is Fabio Sparklemane. I hate him. I hate him so much, and I wish he would die. Chapter 3 Season 1 continues the design trends of Chapter 2 Season 8, but in a bit less of an outlandish way. Uh, a lot of the outfits don't feel as out there or, like, wacky. And I think this season's design philosophy can be perfectly described by Marsha and Marsha Novi, which are two crossover outfits based on Marshmallow. Marsha represents the remixing of old ideas into newer ones and Fortnite's self-referential nostalgia baiting. Marsha Novi represents the adoption of new models as the norm over old ones being reused and the permanence of cell shading in Fortnite's design arsenal. And both of them represent the importance of accuracy to crossover materials as well as the desire to remix them in ways only Fortnite can accomplish, be those remixes with Fortnite's own IP or into new original ideas. I think both of those new outfits are very evocative of the new spirit that Fortnite is trying to embody. Now Chapter 3 Season 2 is a little funky because it acts as a transitioning period between the kitchen sink era and the era of Fortnite that we're currently in the lifestyle era. And I believe this is evidenced by collaborations with brands such as Coachella and the Wu-Tang Clan, and more fashion-forward designed characters such as Tony, Zuri, and Suki 2.0. Their more fashion-focused designs are a taste of what's to come. 
keep in mind, Epic Games hasn't gone face first into what I like to call the lifestyle era yet. There's still some semblance of the Anything Goes era, but I think they're slowly moving into this more fashion-inspired design. And when they do, it becomes the lifestyle era, which lasts from Chapter 3, Season 3, until the present. And by the present, I mean where the timeline of this video cuts off in Chapter 4, Season 2. Chapter 3, Season 3 goes all in on its own original, high fashion-inspired designs, especially evidenced by its battle pass. The influence is not just limited to fashion, but modern lifestyle designs present in modern culture that have been elevated into hyper-reality. I'd say two of the most obvious examples of this in the battle pass are Sabina and Evie. Their designs, if those aren't high fashion, then I don't know what is. And keep in mind, I'm not a fashionista by any semblance of the word. I am not a professional when it comes to discussing fashion. So if I'm wrong about this, please let me know in the comments. But I personally believe this is where Fortnite truly takes a deep dive into the world of fashion. And of course, it's not just limited to the battle pass. There are other outfits that sort of emanate this lifestyle influence. One such outfit is Cause Peely, who is a mashup of the Cause Skeleton, and who we've seen previously in Fortnite, and the original Fortnite character Peely. This is once again reiterating that Fortnite wants to integrate its own IP into high-end lifestyle. One interesting trend I've noticed is that a lot of the fashion forward characters have been predominantly female. This is evidenced by outfits like Veronica, Nia, Sid, and Slayer Charlotte. And don't get me wrong, it's not exclusively female. Outfits like Phantasm, for example, definitely take fashion inspiration, but it's interesting to note that it has been a predominantly female uh, design trend. Now, one aspect of design that Fortnite has always been good about has been diversity. Whether that's diversity in art style and tone and creativity, or if it's diversity in a more traditional sense, be that in uh, gender representation and skin tone. So it comes as no surprise to me that in this era of Fortnite, we start seeing explicit LGBTQ plus representation included in characters such as Maisie and Dreamer. As we'll come to discuss more, and as we have been discussing, modern Fortnite design sensibilities are all about reflecting what's going on in culture. Fortnite wants to keep its finger on the beating pulse of pop culture, be that with collaborations or with the fashion influence. So it makes all the sense in the world to me that as pop culture becomes more accepting and diverse of LGBTQ plus ideas, Fortnite itself will also become more diverse. Moving into chapter 3 season 4, I definitely think it is starting to take a few more cues from the kitchen sink era, but it definitely does leave its foot grounded in modernity. Take Meow Skulls for example. She's the least groundbreaking of the four so far Meowsles based skins, but she represents Fortnite's continued anchoring to its past by remixing an old design idea into a punk inspired one, taking that sort of revolutionary idea that Meow Skulls, Meow Skulls, Meow Skulls represented at the time and putting it into that sort of like punk street fashion inspired design sensibility that newer seasons are adopting. And Spider Gwen makes all the sense in the world as a Fortnite skin. Using her design from across the Spider-Verse, a movie near universally praised for its bold mashing together of artistic ideas, the shading style of Gwen's suit mirrors the films as closely as it can while having normal Fortnite shading on her sneakers and a masked face. Being from a film about multiverse travel and clashing art styles that somehow have cohesive art direction, just like Fortnite, it makes all the sense in the world to have Spider-Gwen and later other Across the Spider-Verse characters represented here. Outfits like Bites, Red Claw, and Remy show the move towards a healthy balance of male and female characters in this modern influence as opposed to the previously predominantly female fashion of the previous season. Chapter 4 Season 1 continues the modern influence but it shifts away from mostly high fashion into what I like to call what I think can only be described as hyper-reality streetwear. Battle Pass skins like Dusty, Kelsey, Masai, and Celine are prime examples of this. And notably, each of them contains some minimal level of asymmetry that's evocative of older design philosophy. I think if you look at one of these characters, it looks like something that you wouldn't think would be out of place walking down the streets of Los Angeles or New York City. However, it's taking 
that sort of modern street fashion and elevating it into almost like supernaturalism or absurdity. Like I said, hyper-reality. But that's not to say that the high fashion influence has been abandoned. Outfits like Snowdancer and Braveheart definitely feel like something you could see walking down the runway today, and Hana feels like a marriage of high fashion and street fashion. And the diversity of art styles continues to evolve and reinforce traditions begun in the breakout art. We've got more anime characters in this season specifically. We get My Hero Academia characters, as well as Gohan and Piccolo. Bright Star is a Fortnite character, Bright Bomber taking on Marvel characteristics, and Hulk is a Marvel character in his alt style taking on Fortnite characteristics. That integration of Fortnite into brands and brands into Fortnite is not abandoned, not in the slightest, and I think both of these outfits being introduced in the same season is a very interesting duality. And Kelleritas is just freaking awesome! <laughs> Moving into the final season of this discussion, Chapter 4 Season 2 definitely continues the fashion influence, but takes more inspiration from Japanese fashion, both Japanese streetwear and traditional Japanese clothing. Other than the specifically Japanese influence of these outfits, the design trends of the past few seasons stay the same. The only other notable outfits I want to mention from this season are the new Across the Spider-Verse outfits in the form of Spider-Man Miles Morales and Spider-Man 2099. Both of them once again display how that movie franchise's use of multiple art directions fits perfectly into Fortnite. It's a no-brainer. And with that, we are done discussing the overall evolution of Fortnite's design philosophies when it comes to character design. While the design philosophies have shifted over the years and while some sense of identity has been lost, it always still feels like Fortnite. Personally, I enjoy all of the eras. I think that the angular arc satisfying consistency just tickles my brain in the right way. You can look at a character and you can instantly recognize that came from early Fortnite. And the breakout arc's wild experimentation led to a lot of very fun and creative ideas, especially with like Meowsles and Kit and the Anything Goes arc simultaneously reigning in an expansion of design philosophies is definitely interesting to watch unfold. If I had to pick a favorite arc, I'd probably go with the Breakout arc. With that said, thank you for watching! This was a ton of fun to research, and noticing and being able to pick up on these design trends was so much fun, and it really makes me appreciate the art direction of Fortnite even that much more. If anyone from Epic Games is watching this, thank you for creating such a unique and diverse game. That's all for me. Let me know your favorite Fortnite designs and your favorite design trends in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Chapter 3, Season 3 goes all in. Oh, there goes the script.